Thank you, Benita, and thank you, Kelly, uh, for bringing me back to Atlanta. It's been a while. I'm really happy to be back in the, in the area, as especially as one of the fastest growing regions in the United States. Um, there, you have a lot of challenges, and uh, hopefully, the, my comments over the next few minutes will provide some clarity and hopefully not confusion. If maybe in agreement, then at least in disagreement, we sort of get you going in one direction or the other. Um, and if I can do that, then I think there's some help. I may have provided some value to the discussion. Um, what I want to do uh, is really talk, I was sort of thinking about the title as I was flying in, and um, I thought for a minute, well, you could sort of look at that, and you might think you're walking into a, a grant-making seminar where I would give you um, where to go at USDOT or wherever to get money. Um, in fact, what I want to focus on is really how the environment in which we are funding transportation in the United States is fundamentally changing in ways that I don't think most people realize. And so over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the funding environment. Generally, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we face in practical terms and then draw a little bit on some of the work we're doing in China to really think outside the box. Um, because we're really not anywhere... Any, I've been following the transportation debate in Washington for over three years at this point. And I'll, by the way, I'm happy to answer any questions that might be more specific or you know, afterwards. But I really think we need to understand that this is just not the same place that we were for the last 50 years in transportation funding and finance. And so where we go from here is still up in the air, but I think there are some indications about what the priorities will be and how that's going to shift, and frankly, what it means for metropolitan areas like Atlanta and elsewhere. Um, first of all, just uh, because I like to provide some context, and I get this question a lot. Many, I don't know if many of you know about the Reason Foundation, but we're a free market think tank based out of Los Angeles. Interestingly enough, our, I view our transportation work as not being particularly ideological. It's actually fairly numbers driven and fairly secular, and I think this helps put this in perspective for me because we've had several commissions that have tried to assess what the funding needs for the U.S. transportation system are and then sort of figure out whether or not we have revenues to cover them. And this is just one summary table from one of those commissions. And you can see that uh, if we look at our uh, sort of the, the needs, the yellow is the gap. In other words, that's, we are only covering about <coughs> 40% of the funding needs of the system on the state, local, and federal level. And it actually doesn't get better when we only look at the federal contribution, because in fact, if we just look at the federal government in terms of needs in the gap, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars per year that represents the gap. And in case you haven't also noticed this, that there's this little question about how we're going to fund the deficit, uh, our debt and the deficit. And here's the real issue that I think we have to come to grips with. And it actually is something I had to learn the hard way. Transportation issues are second and third order priorities in Washington, D.C. They are never first order priorities. Transportation will never be able to compete for the attention of congressmen when they have to deal with Medicare, Medicaid, defense, flare-ups in the Middle East, you name it, there are going to be a dozen or more issues that are going to rise to more important levels than transportation. To be honest, the reason we've been able to do as well as we have up until now is because most of our presidents have ignored transportation and let the transportation secretaries basically handle it, and we've had a dedicated revenue stream in terms of the gas tax to fund it. So in other words, we didn't have to worry about the meddling of the in the top priorities because we had this trust fund and those monies were spent on transit and highways and really nobody cared as long as it didn't affect the president's next election cycle and for the most part they did but that world no longer exists the gas tax is going to be gone within the next 20 or 30 years it's simply there and actually I was talking about this earlier to someone um, some people might think it's the green technology investments that are going to drive it it's really not it's India, China, Brazil, and Africa. That, and as their growth begins to ratchet up the demand for oil, because they have very, access to very conventional technologies, that's going to put pressure on gas prices in the U.S. They're going to go, I mean, we think $4 a gallon is bad. Just, it's going to get worse. But 
here's the key. What's going to happen is we're not going to give up our cars. There's nothing in anything of the, of the behavioral and travel trends that I've seen that suggests we're going to give up our cars. What we're going to do is we're going to figure out a different way to power those cars. And if you go back to 1900 when we were just starting the automobile, we had cars that were being driven by steam, that were powered by steam. Even there was experimentation with solar, even way back then, um, it was terribly inefficient, so it didn't go very far. You had coal-fired plants, you, uh, cars, you actually had electric cars. You had all the hybrids. They, that technology even existed then. Now we're at a point where we get the price point of gasoline to the point that, that those technologies are going to advance so quickly, we're simply going to change the fuel in which we use to drive our automobiles. So in other words, um, Gas prices are going to go up. That's going to shift technology to more efficient systems, which means the gas taxes disappear. Those revenues are gone. So the question is, what do we do about this? Well, at the end of the day, um, and let's, keep, let's also keep something else in mind. When we're looking at our transportation challenges, it's not an engineering challenge. We can build the facilities. Uh, that's been very clear. Whether you're, this is the Tampa Crosstown Expressway, which is relatively recent, um, even in Orange County, California, one of the most congested places in the world, or actually, no, the United States, not the world, I've been to Beijing, um, and Shanghai, and Xi'an, and other places. Um, actually, we're, we're great compared to those. But, and we're looking at uh, the Big Dig and other places, we can build it. I mean, there's no question we have the engineering ability to build it. Um, if we have the political will, we can do it as well. The question is, how do we fund it? And that's really uh, the central issue and without a gas tax. Um, I mean, a little be around just isn't going to generate the revenue you need, but we're talking about gaps of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Well, at the end of the day, I think it's going to come down to pricing. And again, this is not an ideological, uh, 20 years ago this could be ideology. I'm, I'm an economist, I love pricing. I think it's good. I think, it I think markets work. And so I'm all, all good on the pricing part of it, theoretically and practically. But this issue now is, is really much more secular in terms of the way I approach this. Where, if you don't have a gas tax, you could go to general sales taxes, but you know what, if you, it doesn't take a lot to read the current political environment to know that income taxes, sales taxes, even property taxes are going to be really tough to raise in this environment on the local level, let alone at the federal level, which of course is more income tax revenue. So where is the money going to come from? Uh, you can throw up your hands, but the reality is we still have the infrastructure, we're going to fund it, we're going to figure it out. And this is where the subtleties of pricing, I think, are increasingly becoming apparent. Because pricing is really about a user fee. It's about charging people that are using the facilities for a value, a monetary value, for the benefit of those facilities. And it has a lot of potential, because first of all, what it does is it creates a dedicated revenue stream. This is, that's what we learned from the gas tax. How do we get all this infrastructure built? We had, we had a dedicated revenue stream. The problem is technology is making that revenue stream obsolete. It no longer works. Pricing allows you to tie revenue to specific facilities that people use, and those revenues can sustain those, uh, those facilities in terms of finance. So it monetizes the value of those projects, um, and it is sustainable. The other thing is that it really puts front and center a critical question about how we prioritize what facilities to invest in. It makes willingness to pay the central question. You want to know if you should be putting $100 million into a, the next couple miles of a, of a roadway? Look at whether people are willing to pay for it. And if they're willing to pay for it, then actually a lot, of, a lot of issues go away in terms of a lot of this political controversy over whether we should build this road or that road disappears if people are willing to pay for it. We've actually found this happen in Minneapolis and Los Angeles and other places where there's been a lot of public opposition to a toll road until the toll road opens. When the toll road opens, we find that literally public support flips from being 60 or 75 percent against to 60 or 75 percent in favor, even for people that don't use it. It's because the benefit becomes tangible, the benefit becomes obvious, and people are willing to pay for it, and actually, and it helps set a priority. And th that means that pricing creates transparency. That's huge in terms of looking at public finance and getting public support. By being able to tie revenues to specific facilities that provide a specific service, you create transparency and accountability. So I think that these are very practical types of <coughs> characteristics of pricing. This is really not ideological. I'm not actually going into some ivory tower and sort of thinking about this. This is actually what we've seen happen when tolling 
has been used. Um, the other thing that's got to be part of this is we need to think about how we deliver these facilities. And we at Reason Foundation are big fans of public-private partnerships, um, competitive contracting. We've got a 30-year track record on these, um, using these kinds of arrangements. Where, by the way, we don't have rose-colored glasses. In fact, a lot of what is motivating my work in China now is to examine public-private partnerships, how they worked in China, but also where they failed because those failures tell you a lot about how you need to structure these agreements to protect both the public and the private interest involved. So, nevertheless, um, they started out, and I can talk about some of these uh, in more detail in the Q&A if you're interested, um, started out great, and then we had some falters, in, particularly around Chicago and Indiana. Then we had some real challenges where public-private partnerships didn't go very far. Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, Ed Rendell tried to run it. Again, this is also a Republican and Democrat thing. It's bipartisan. It's not really partisan in the sense that it's ideologically one party or the other. Ed Rendell, of course, is a Democrat, tried to use public-private partnership to on um, Interstate 80, went, didn't go very far. South Bay Expressway near San Diego has gone into bankruptcy. Many of you are familiar with the Southern Connector in Greenville, South Carolina. So these are challenges. And so the, really the question became, what motivated us is this very simple question. How come the rest of the world can do these and we can't? Because when we look around the rest of the, at, at the benefits of private participation, what we're able to do is use the efficiencies of, of the private sector to deliver these projects. We're able to leverage the market. We can take advantages of private capital markets. There's over $300 billion out there in the world capital market that can be used on our roads. Why do they have to be used in India? Why do those dollars have to be invested in China? Um, they could be invested here, and it allows us to also think in terms of transferring risk off taxpayers toward the private sec sector. And in fact, South Bay Expressway, I believe, even though it went into bankruptcy, it's going to become a success story because the people who took the risk on that were not the taxpayers. It was the private equity interests, and they've reorganized. They just emerged out of bankruptcy very recently. So a lot of the things that a lot of the private partnerships that were considered failures or weaknesses actually are turning out to be pretty strong if we let the process work. And then, but here's the other issue. Who uses um, private, public-private partnerships? Uh, basically the entire world. Um, uh, everything, and here's the motivated, here's the issue for us here too as well. Why did China start using public, why did communist China start using public-private partnerships? And then we're talking about the early and mid-1980s. So they're, they began to open up their economy in 79, 78. Well, it was very simple. They didn't have any money. Their economy did not generate any revenue. So the question is, how are you going to build highways? How are you going to build transit systems? How are you going to build all of this infrastructure if you don't have any money? Well, you go across the border to Hong Kong, and you go to all those private capitalists, and you say, if you have money to invest, we've got a place for you to invest. And tell you what, we're going to let you toll it, and so you, have, you can monetize the value of that, and you can pay off the bonds and make a little bit of money. And uh, 20 years later, they've got the, interstate, the equivalent of the U.S. interstate highway system linking up all of the major cities in China. So this is a non-trivial mechanism that the rest of the world <coughs> uses to try and build this. And it's, it's, it's really a response to some of the same pressures we're facing now, although in a different context because we're a developed country and we have a mature transportation system. Um, these are just a sampling of the different public-private partnerships in highway, just in highways that we've been looking at in different provinces. Everything, Hubei to uh, Shanxi, Guangdong, um, Sichuan, which is, all of these places, the total mileage, total investment, I can certainly give you uh, copies of the slide. Um, obviously, this is very active, but more importantly, there are over 20 expressway companies that are listed on stock exchanges in China. So these are private companies that are building it through public-private partnership agreements with the communist governments in the provincial level, usually at the provincial level, but allowed by the national government as well. So does the U.S. need P3s? Yes, I think we do. I'm sorry I'm moving along because I've got five more minutes on my little timer, or else I think I disappear, I go pop up or something like that, and go away. Um, because public-private partnerships, but they are supplemental. I mean, it's very important to keep in mind that it's not clear that roads always are going to pay for themselves or they're going to solve all the problems. What it does is it fills a very important niche in that it allows us to leverage existing revenues in that going into transportation. And they can be used to really build facilities that are a lot more diverse than we usually think about. Again, going back to the points of sustainable revenue stream, um, 
we can actually create a hierarchy in terms of facilities and how these work. I mean, in my view, if you've got a facility that will pay for itself, why get in the way? I mean, it's nobody else's burden. Just let it pay for itself and then take your money and sort of leverage other facilities that still have economic value or, or transportation value, but not, may not be able to fully pay for it themselves right now. So if we think about that, I mean, for, if you pay for yourself, let's just put the legislation in place to let those things go and let them, let them move, let the private sector handle it, and so the public sector doesn't have to be, get caught up on it. Um, but the, also, the other important thing is to allow private capital to leverage public dollars. And there are a lot of ways that you can structure these more specifically. They're called availability payments. Miami is using it in Florida to leverage a public-private partnership to build a tunnel um, over to the port. It's, been, it's actually gotten that project off the ground where it wouldn't have gotten anywhere close. So the public sector still shoulders some responsibility. Um, actually, I think this might have paid for itself, but for political reasons, they decided to make it more of an availability payment um, situation because of the way they wanted to manage access to the port. Um, they were a little bit uh, fearful that the pricing might limit access more than they wanted to. So, But the other thing that's really intriguing, and again, it's something we're learning from China, is the extent to which you can use tolling to actually fund smaller transportation projects. We have, and there's an example here in Florida, again, in Sarasota, where they're taking intersections and they're actually tolling intersections. They're building new capacity in congested intersections on arterials and collectors. And they're essentially what they're doing is they're providing you a way to jump over the intersection. They actually build a, a lane that goes over the intersection. You can have the choice of going through the stoplight and waiting five minutes, or you can spend a quarter and go over the intersection, what's called a queue jumper. And they're tolling it. We've got the technology to do this. 20 years ago, we couldn't do it. But with electronic tolling that allows you to price variably uh, based on the the amount of congestion on the road, we can do things that we could, or just dreams. They were actually just sort of, they truly were ivory tower thoughts uh, by people like the economist William Vickery in 1962 saying, can't we just do this? Well, now we can. And we're doing it. So interchanges and off-ramps in Sydney, Australia, there's actually an off-ramp that goes into a, onto a major highway that they just built by tolling it. And they didn't have the money to build the off-ramp, it was a major road, so they tolled it. And uh, they're able to do that. High volume arterials and collectors is actually one of the ways that China has built many of its roads. It's the, not the limited access highways. They've told it using more uh, conventional technology, which creates some inefficiencies. The beauty of what we have in the US is that we can actually use the latest technology to really get, squeeze all the efficiencies out of this kind of tolling. And again, 20 years ago, we weren't even thinking about this because the, the technology wasn't there, but it's there now. When a recent foundation, as Benita alluded to, has been really working on case studies to try and figure out how we can use these pricing strategies to build new capacity in different parts of U.S. urbanized areas. Atlanta was one of our first case studies. Really, would, uh, and I can sort of talk a little bit more about that. But a key part of this uh, is going back and saying, okay, well, if we did price these, could we actually, th these facilities pay for themselves? What I like about this chart is that we're talking about very expensive facilities in terms of tunnels. Tunnels typically cost four to five times more than a typical uh, surface expressway. But when we toll them, and this is South Pasadena, Palmdale, Glendale, Los Angeles, a very congested area, we're actually, we, our estimates suggested that these facilities, these toll roads, these tunnels could fully pay for themselves if, in fact, you allowed them to be built using public-private partnerships and use the tolling to actually generate the revenues to do that. We then began to experiment with hot lanes and, and networks, and we found that many of these facilities have come very close to covering their, uh, their full costs. Um, our study of Atlanta, which included four major projects, including the regional hot lane network, which is very similar to what's actually been proposed, as well as tunnels, would pay up to 78% of the cost, again, by using tolling in a creative way using the latest technology. What I want to spend a little more time on is talking about Chicago, because this is a study that we've been working on for the last two and a half years, where we're proposing a hot network with expressways in three tunnels. $48 billion in infrastructure improvements, that includes the cost of the tunnels. Our estimates suggest that 110% of the cost can be covered by tolling. Now, one of the ways we do this in our studies, which is different from the way a lot of transportation planners look at their studies, we price for speed. We don't price for maximum throughput. 
which is typically the way the engineers will look at these. So that's where you get, well, what we're going to do is we're going to price for getting 45 miles per hour because that maximizes through throughput. As an economist, we sort of look at it a little differently. People are driving not because we like, we just like the idea that we're getting as many cars through. We're in a vehicle, whether it's a bus, whether it's a train or a car, because we want to get from point A to point B fast. So the value that we're able to capture in the tolling is through the benefit of accessibility, which is through the speed at which you're able to get to your final destination. So when we're pricing Chicago, we price Chicago at freeway speeds. We didn't price it at 45 speeds. We're there to maximize revenue, but also we think that maximizes the economic benefit of those facilities as well. So what we're in, here's a quick breakdown of the Chicago, of the sort of the lane miles that we're, we've modeled as part of this. Um, our regional hot network is almost over a thousand lane miles, of, and this is all new capacity. We we uh, we would toll it all. Um, we're very aggressive on that. This is the way it looks visually. This is sort of our, an outer beltway. Uh, these are these red ones are the tunnels. This crosstown tunnel has been on the books for 30 years, never been built. Um, our modeling found, by the way, that probably the outer beltway. Mm -hmm. What, and this tunnel right here are the single most important features of our transportation network because they provided regional access at levels that simply don't exist at this point. It's very interesting because that actually came through the modeling. We would not have known that just by um, sort of working on this from our gut or just uh, conventional wisdom. What we were able to do, though, is think about the hot network where we sort of take not only these new capacity areas, but also trying to connect some of these other major roads into a hot network, very similar to what you're, trying, you're proposing in Atlanta right now. So you can get freeway speed access to any point in the Chicago region 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was what our vision for this transportation network was. And if you priced it at that level, whoops, if you priced it at that level, we were able to forecast 110% revenues, 110% over capital costs. If you, we did discover that this tunnel here and this tunnel here, while they're important, they're not as important as that, as this, which is the Crosstown Tunnel. So if you would push these tunnels to a phase two of the project, we still gen we generated revenues 140% of the costs of the infrastructure that we're proposing. Um, so, this can be done through public-private partnerships, um, all sorts of things. Now, this is what I think is also intriguing about Atlanta, is that I love, at this point, first blush, your hot lanes, your managed lanes network. Because you're thinking about it as a network, not as individual facilities. What we learned from Chicago is that most of the economic benefits and the revenue that comes from that comes from having a network that works well and functions efficiently. So the fact you're thinking about building this all out is really pretty darn critical. It's not about building one segment of 10 miles of hot lanes. While that certainly benefits the people that are going to be using it directly, where you get the regional benefits is your ability to link all of these different destinations together in, in a system very similar to what we're proposing for Chicago, which will allow you fast access to most major points within the region. And frankly, I think that also creates a competitive advantage over other cities, which frankly aren't anywhere near as far along as you are in terms of your planning and thinking about this. Um, and I thought this was really quite interesting because we've done these similar types of analyses for other metropolitan areas. If you look at what the effect of that hot managed lane network will be, will be in 2030, this is what the region would have with 40 minute access to the downtown and 90 minute access to the downtown with the network, you're really providing a truly connected region. And that's what I look, and, and you can just see it here in the way this is designed. And then just from the, the assessment they've done on speeds. Now, if you would actually price to allow people to access it at freeway speeds, you would actually see this even bigger than what is there right now. So, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is that we believe that there is no choice, really, about where we're going to go in terms of finance. It has to go toward a more of a direct user pays, beneficiary pays type of financing system because that's the only one that's going to be sustainable. The other is to make sure, particularly in this climate, 
that those facilities are delivered efficiently and cost effectively, which means that public-private partnerships really have to be a critical part of that solution. Um, they're not the panacea, but they are a critical element of how we manage and build those facilities. Um, they are effective at not only building facilities that can fully pay for themselves, but they're very effective at leveraging existing dollars far beyond where they can be taken today. And actually, there's some examples where, in Texas in particular, where they've tried to not go the P-free route, and they are now suffering the consequences. Um, and uh, I can talk a little bit more about that, too. The other thing that P3s allow mm -hmm. you to do is really engage private equity. That's where the money's coming from, is the private capital markets. And the whole thing works because we're moving to a system that's not based on general taxation. We are moving to one that is really driven by customer preferences and a willingness to pay criteria that can be monetized through pricing. It's not the same tolling. I remember going, to Jersey, uh, going up to Garden State Parkway when I was a kid and we were throwing the quarters in the, in the toll booths. That's not what we're talking about. This is open road tolling. You're going 55, 65 miles an hour underneath an electronic gantry. You don't stop. It electronically bills your credit card or debit card to whatever account you want. And you have a seamless system of transportation for the entire region. The real question is, are we going to let other countries get the jump on us? We have a technological advantage. We have a wealth advantage that other countries don't. But I'll tell you, having spent the last four years traveling and working in China, China's willing to make the investment in what they need. They haven't quite figured out how to do it because they don't have the wealth to sustain it at, at this point. So with that, I went over how long I was supposed to go. I kept you guys longer, so I apologize. But do we have time for... We have time for some questions, okay. and I'm going to ask the first one. Um, you mentioned that the, the HOT network and... One of the things I talked about earlier is the fact that we have $13.5 billion of mass transit projects. How does the hot lane network uh, fit in with transit? Could you talk about your experiences on that? Yeah, actually one of the more interesting things about the mass lane network is that it enables a higher level of transit service than can be achieved now. Uh, we've used, uh, developed the concept, or I, I haven't, but Bob Poole and, and others, of a virtual exclusive busway. By essentially creating a network that ensures 24-7 freeway access, you can use the capacity in those lanes to provide high quality bus service that can get people to different destinations. And we, uh, San Francisco is experimenting with that. So I actually think there are ways that you can use the managed lane network to really leverage the potential benefits of transit. It uh, doesn't do a lot for MARTA because that's a fixed route system and that you're, it's, it doesn't go to the same places. But in terms of leveraging dollars, these kinds of investments can really be helpful. And you actually get a point where you know, roads and uh, cars and buses play well together, which is kind of fun. Um, it's rare that we actually find that. But it, it's a win-win in that sense. Sean? I've been, actually, I've been over a lot of those uh, tollways in China, and it does seem to work fairly well. The one thing it seems like to me here in the United States that we're going to need to do is to move to, or actually we're going to need to just change our laws such to provide protection for these transponders, that are actually the transponder data. So what I see happening is one of two things. Someone's going to start taking this data and tracing where people are going and all that, and there's going to be a big blow up in the crisis and everything. Or, on the other side, you're going to have the pedophile or kidnapper or whatever else, and there's going to be some sob story about this little child or whatever, that could, this could have been stopped had we had just a, a way to track this person and find them. That seems like to me to be really one of the big issues in terms of getting widespread acceptance, so everybody's willing to put a transponder in the car and use these systems to go Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, the, one of the biggest barriers to getting these systems in place in the U.S., yeah, our privacy issues. I mean, what's going to happen to that data when they start tracking it? Now, the interesting thing is that these are technologically solvable. It's a, it's a question of what technology you use. And you actually, we have a number of choices for doing it. And not all technology tracks the individual, each person where they are at specific locations. Uh, and I think that's really the debate. In fact, this is what killed road pricing in the Netherlands, is that concern about privacy, or which is really what's going to happen to that data. So I think the, real, the next step in order to, to put this in place is to create fairly well-defined rules for what that data is used for. Interestingly enough, in the U.S., 
most people are much more comfortable with that data being handled by a private company than they are government. And mainly because I think most of our experiences with credit cards and, and whatever it might be, we have an agreement that we actually have to sign as part of that. And we feel like there's a contractual, at least we may not pay attention to the agreement. I mean, I haven't read my agreement in a long time. But there's at least a contract between the user and the provider that provide that could be upheld in a court of law. Whereas we think that if the government has control of all that data, we don't have confidence that they will abide by those rules. So that's really the next issue. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, there aren't any real clear answers at this point. I do know enough about the technology to know they're solvable. The, but we have a lot of real policy issues that we have to sort through about what we're comfortable with. And we can, the other thing is the technology is at a point where we have different places that can adopt different approaches. So some can use GPS um, forms, others can be, can sort of use point of purchase types of tolling, um, depending on the level of tolerance about how that data is used. Um, and it can be interchangeable too. Um, in, in, the <clears throat> in the context of shrinking gas tax dollars, a large topic of discussion has become vehicle miles traveled type of system. Does this comport at all, and if so, how? Yeah, this does. Um, vehicle miles traveled, in the broader sense, is simply charging a fee for how much of the roadway you use. And when we think about VM, uh, VMT, vehicle miles traveled systems, usually that's about we're, we're applying that to the entire road network. Um, very often with the pricing, well, I've outlined here, it's more on the highway network or the major collectors and arterials, which we can do it. But it is part of that overall set of view of how you work, of how you change the financing system. Because the other thing is that what we realize, and we know this, the real costs, the real burden on a road network is not even really the vehicles, it's how often you use the vehicles, how heavy are those vehicles, and trying to parse out what those impacts are more clearly with actual use. Um, the president has unveiled a, a major high-speed rail network, which is, you know, financially very, very ambitious. Um, and what does that do in policy to transfer the attention um, of the national agenda to the high-speed rail versus our highway capacity and um, these innovations for the states on the near term? Oh, you want me to get me in trouble with um, let me uh, put it this way. Two and a half years ago, there was a consensus in the policy community at the federal and for the most part the state level about where we needed to go because we were at a critical juncture. Everyone knew the gas tax was going to disappear. We have these huge uh, shortfalls in need between needs and revenues, and we needed to move transportation policy in a fundamentally different way. Um, the current president chose different priorities, which has really derailed the entire discussion at this point. And most of that has been focused on high-speed rail. Um, irrespective of whether you think high-speed rail is effective as a project or not, it clearly diverted attention from these bread and butter types of issues on roads. And even a bigger discussion about who really should be responsible for it. Um, my view and is that really our transportation problems, when we're talking about the the roads and the, so the, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, really those decisions need to be moved to the state and local level because they're in the best position to determine what those priorities are, as well as to deal with some of these technology issues. Um, on the debate, in part, in large part because it's been sidetracked under the high-speed rail, no pun intended, sorry about that, but also because there's not been attention to the funding and the priority list. That's really delayed this whole discussion for at least two and a half years. And I, frankly, I don't see that changing. I think it's up to the states to really drive that discussion. So we have a maglev initiative going on in West Georgia. Um, and, and obviously, you've been to China, and you probably are quite aware of what's going on with the, mag, the, the maglev uh, in Shanghai. Um, could you speak a little about that? And oh, Can we expect to see any more maglev in China? Uh, uh, maglev, no. Um, High-speed rail, yes, uh, but China is a very, very different place than the U.S. And I've blogged on this extensively out of control. Uh, first of all, China has a culture of riding rails, 
which we do not, we used to in the 40s and 50s, but we don't now. Um, that creates, that gives trains an advantage. And actually some of our projects in China are actually looking at travel behavior and mode choice between high speed rail, bus rapid transit, and automobiles between cities. Because we're just sort of interested in who really does shift from one mode to the other. And the early research is showing that high speed rail really diverts people from bus rapid transit and doesn't do much to stem the flow of the growth in the, uh, air, in the air travel. But it's, again, it's a very different context. So, but maglev is a very expensive technology, and that was a showcase really put together by Siemens and the Chinese government. And it's great, I've ridden on it, it's smooth, it's wonderful. It's sort of when I saw Apple shrugged and I saw the um, Dagny and Henry Reardon in the front, and they, there was no jostling in the in the cab. I said they're on a maglev, because <laughs> you know, it really is a real smooth ride. It's really cool, but it's very expensive, and it's not at all clear that the benefits um, justify it. Most of the high-speed tra trains in China do not use that technology because of that. Um, China is also making a lot of investments, and they're not paying off in high-speed rail. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, but that's really another hour just to talk about high-speed rail. Oh. Ed, first. <coughs> a lot of what you had to say it is simple and straightforward for a de novo or a greenfield project. The issues that, that we face, and one that's had a lot of false starts in Georgia, is how do you blend a P3 project into existing publicly owned infrastructure? Because more often than not, we're trying to expand capacity. And then, if I can add a second to that, you mentioned the bus rapid transit, but We've got a lot of public transit projects that are nowhere near paying for themselves on a user fee basis. So how would you blend that in, or what becomes of those? I'm willing to beg off on transit for the simple reason that it really would take an hour just sort of to go through what I think has to happen in transit. The next book I want to write is, is the ti working title is Saving Transit. Our transit systems have huge, huge problems, management as well as investment, and it really requires a completely different model for thinking about how you manage those systems. And so, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into it. And a big part of it is the is that they have completely divorced customers in terms of revenue, tying revenues to services. But it's all, uh, transit's actually more complicated than that, too. More complicated, I think, than that. Um, in terms of the uh, brownfield projects, which are integrating these, what you end up doing with the public-private partnerships is you can still add the capacity. And in fact, your managed lane network is adding capacity. And the public-private partnership works is really limited to that capacity that's being added. So there has to be a very good close working relationship between the, the, those that are maintaining and managing the existing facilities as well as the, the new company. But you can certainly manage that particular part of the facility. And in fact, that's the way it's operated in many cases. Um, sometimes you can also just say, look, we're going to turn over the entire management of the entire corridor over to a private company. And part of that is you build up um, you, use the, you build up the new capacity as part of that. So there are a variety of ways that you can manage that. It requires a willingness to experiment, though, and try something that new in the US, if it's not new elsewhere. Um, the main thing about the brownfields are, I don't think they're, they're really about the structure of the public-private partnership, as they are dealing with some engineering challenges that tend to drive costs that are very difficult to predict, which makes the public, which is why availability payments very often end up being a better structure in brownfield projects than in pure 100% toll finance types of projects. One of the big issues we've run into the US, and this is also true elsewhere, is since we don't have as much experience with these as we would like, because tolling really hasn't been used on a broad base for a long enough time, particularly in industrialized countries, we're having trouble really forecasting revenues effectively. And so I think the next round of P3s is going to be trying to come to a better arrangement that allows the sharing of the risk and burden of the revenue forecast. If we look at the Southern Connector and the Pocahontas Freeway, the problem there was the people who were forecasting the revenue, revenues were not the people that were responsible for implementing it. And you actually had a very interesting dynamic that emerged. And one of the reasons is they overestimated the revenue forecast in order to secure the bonds. And the people that went in to build it said, hey, we're not going to be able to do that, but it's too late. I'm going to take two more questions, but before I take those last two questions from there and there, um, I just want to let you know that I do have a copy of Sam's um, PowerPoint, so if you'd like to leave your business card or a note on the table for me, I will be sure to email that to you. We'll put it on our website as well. And we'll put it on our website as well. First question. 
for Atlanta, I assume you're assuming the construction of a lot more concrete <coughs> stuff. But if one was simply converting HOV to HOT, it would seem to me the budget is very modest. Much more modest. And that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. In, in Chicago, there are no HOV lanes. So all of those all of those costs are really new capacity, new concrete, that type of thing. But in, one of the things that's making Atlanta work is you've got an HOV network that allows you to uh, reduce the costs on a per mile basis and really adding technology and just and so on the margin it's a lot more cost effective, which is why you can get away with what you're doing for sixteen billion dollars. And it's not going to be thirty billion dollars. Is substantially larger than that. Great point, thank you. <clears throat> the Chinese don't have two problems that we have. Number one is they don't have any not in my backyard stuff going on. <laughs> and secondly, the central government has all the power. Here, you've got disparate governments, way too many of them, and they all want to have a part in the planning. Now, how do you get past that in order to build something that's efficient? The most efficient thing we've done in the last 70 years was the Eisenhower interstate system. And, that, and not, you're, that's not what you're describing. Yeah. One of the interesting things I learned about, I'll take the second part first and then go to the first part. Um, one of the interesting things I learned about China was how much of this construction was not driven by the national government. In fact, almost none of it. All of these public-private partnerships are done at what it would be the equivalent of the state and municipal level. So in fact, there, it's, that's sort of, one of well, another reason why I think there's something we can learn here. The national government did planning. They said, okay, you can put it this way, it has to, the, net, the ends have to connect, but they really didn't do anything. They backed it out, backed out of the financing part of it. Um, uh, the other is, uh, actually, um, the, yeah, I'm excited about the second one. The first, what was the first one? Pardon that again? Not in my backyard. Not in my backyard. Um, that, that, that's an issue. Um, what we have is a very open, litigious, litigious system that allows people to insert themselves into the process whether they have anything to gain or not. Um, what, but even in China's case, though, what makes the, those roads work was that many of those roads were being built in relatively rural areas, and you had the leadership to commit to building the roads in the urban areas. Uh, again, the, at the end of the day, in the U.S., what you need is a win-win. And I've actually had to work with NIMBYs in my planning board and elsewhere. I know exactly what you're talking about. There are ways to handle it. Um, it's a very different political context, and, but it can be done. And in fact, we do see that. And short of it is, in, even in the US, if you have the political leadership, and I'm not advocating this, public roads are, uh, there's never, uh, public roads are public roads, they're public facilities. If you had to, eminent domain could be used. I think what we find, interestingly enough, is when the private sector is involved, eminent domain is used less. The reason is actually quite straightforward once you burrow into the issue. For the private sector, time is money. Anytime you go into a court, into the court, you're lengthening the time it takes to get anything done. So it's a very expensive process. So what they do is they go in, they sweep in, they give you what you need to get out of the way so they can build a road. And so, in fact, eminent domain is not used as much. And uh, you end up purchasing the property faster and consolidating the rights away faster. Well, Kelly McCutcheon has the last question, yes, which I actually wrote, wrote for him, so go <laughs> ahead. Real, real quick, quick question. We've had a hard time building an outer perimeter road in, in Atlanta. How many outer perimeter roads do they have in Beijing? Well, they're, they've got, they're working on their sixth um, <laughs> perimeter road. One of the things, and we talk about this in mobility first, in fact, it's about the transportation planning. Uh, keeping in mind that Beijing is a city of uh, probably now 16 or 17 million, so it's a, it's a little different context. But one of the things we have to do, and one of the things that we found in Chicago is one of the most important things for improving mobility in Chicago is building another out of the Beltway, and that's a city of 9 million, so an urbanized area of 9 million. So these perimeter roads have to be part of the transportation planning mix, particularly given the way our travel patterns exist. Um, I know there are issues that come up with it, and we don't have time to deal with them, but they can be, most of these problems can be handled and solved in one way. It just has to be created and thinking a little bit outside the box. All right, thank you very much.
of course, with the nymph, not my backyard question that immediately thought of the outer perimeter. Thank you, Sam. Um, the Reason Foundation is one of the best think tanks in the country. We're so grateful for them and our working relationship. And thank you for all the work you've done, Sam. And it's great to have you today. Uh, hope to see you on May 12th. And don't forget to fill up the envelopes that are at your t uh, table and send them back to us. Thanks a lot. We're adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.